Well, welcome everyone. So this talk is called Burn It Down and Start Again, Principles of Modern JavaScript. And so before we dive too deep into the code, I want to think about the word modern. What, what does it mean? Uh-oh, already one glitch. There we go. So here's a, here's a painting. You know, it's a, a pretty nice painting. If you don't, you know, aren't into art, you can tell that this is done by someone who's very skilled. You know, there's nice composition, good color, good use of light. Now, you may not recognize this painting, but it's that you almost certainly know the person who painted it. The thing about this painting was this was done when the artist was 17 years old. And even at 17, you could already tell that they were a master of technique. You could just see it in the way they laid it out and the colors they use. But something happened to this artist. And it, it was one of those transitions that kind of moved from what we would consider kind of pre-modern art to modern art. And the artist went to an exhibit in Paris and he saw this piece among others. And it was an exhibit of African and Oceanic art. And the author was, uh, the, the artist was Pablo Picasso. And he saw this and it all of a sudden gave him a new way of thinking, a new way of, of thinking about how to show the human form, how to display, display images, how to create shapes and forms. And so what I think was really interesting about this was he, he clearly was a master of technique before and he got these new ideas and it didn't change what he, the technique he had, but it made it give him a new way of thinking about things. And so he started producing pieces like this, Guernica, super famous, super famous image and very different. And this is something that we would consider modern art. You know, so there's this shift that often takes place where you have, you have things that are very good, um, but then a new ideas come in, new ways of approaching things and you get a new conception. So let's turn to code. So this is JavaScript as we wrote it kind of pre-2015. Uh, so what we call pre-ES6. And looking at it now, something about it kind of feels strange if you've written, if you write JavaScript now, it just looks a little off. But this would be considered really good JavaScript code at the time, because it was really the best that we could do with the, the tools that we had available. So here's that same code that does the exact same thing, but written in more modern syntax. And everything about it just feels different. Even if you don't know what the syntax means, you can, you can kind of feel that there's a change here. You can feel that things are more simplified, more, more straightforward. There's, they're doing more with less. And so what's interesting to me are what happened that made that shift? You know, the big thing was the syntax, but the syntax came with new ideas. Syntax follows ideas, it's not the other way around. So going back to Pablo Picasso, here is one of his famous series, it's called Studies on a Bull. And he took a, a bull and he started redrawing it, trying to simplify it. Every time, every time he redrew it, he'd make it more and more abstract till it got down to the very essence. And I found that's what happens with JavaScript. We have this code that was long and it worked and we're getting new syntax. And as we get the new syntax, we start to strip it down. We start to make it go smaller and smaller to see what we can do with the least amount of code. Well, maybe not really the least amount of code, how we can use new syntax to make our code easier to understand, easier to skim, easier to read. So I'm Joe Morgan, as I've mentioned a couple of times. I'm on Twitter at Joe S. Morgan, and I'm based out of Lawrence, Kansas. So if there are any Python fans here, um, the framework Django was, was built in Lawrence, Kansas. Lawrence has about 30,000 people. So that's, that's kind of our technology claim to fame is Django project. Um, I do a lot of writing. So I've written a book for, for pragmatic programmers called Simplifying JavaScript. I've also written for a few different, different websites. If you're looking to use React, I wrote a 20 part series for DigitalOcean. So there's a lot, lot going on there. If you like what I, how I talk, you may like some of the stuff I write. And um, feel free to reach out. I'm gonna go back actually and show my contact information. The hardest thing about doing these virtually is we don't get to have that after the talk conversations where we can hang out in the lobby and, and talk about ideas. So we'll have some of that at the end, some question and answer, but please feel free to reach out at me. One of the big advantages is of course, I can communicate with you all who are all throughout the world. And so we can keep this conversation going. This isn't a one-time thing, reach out to me anytime. I really do mean it. All right, most important thing though is I write code. You know, I'm, I'm a developer just like you all. I sit down every morning, I open my text editor, and I think, how can I write code that'll be easier to maintain, that will last the long term? And so when I think about JavaScript, there's four principles that kind of come up in modern JavaScript. Modern JavaScript is predictable, readable, 
simple, and flexible. And those are roughly in order of importance. Predictable is more important than simple. Readable is more important than flexible. That's why I kind of caught myself earlier when I said trying to make it as short as possible, because that's not the most important thing. And so over this talk, I'm going to go through each of these, to each of these principles. And I'm going to talk about what these principles mean with modern syntax. But the thing that's really exciting about JavaScript is every year we are getting new syntax, new features. And what I found is that if you don't have a good set of principles for what makes good code, it's really tough to kind of think about how some of these new features fit into the code you're writing. So I want to, as I talk, I'm going to talk about features that already exist. And then I'm going to talk about features that are either new, they've only been out for a year or two, or that are still in the process of, of finalizing. And I'm going to talk about how those can be used in your code. So that way you can have this framework to kind of evaluate new features as they come out. All right, so starting with predictable. Predictable code really just means that you can know the future. And the reason this is important is that we write code for humans. And this is something that is easy to forget. You know, humans need things like spacing. They need things like indentation. They need things like clear variable names. Machines don't need any of that. You know, when we, when we compile down JavaScript, we reduce all that stuff out, we reduce all that extra white space. And the reason this is so important for humans is because when we write code, we're dealing with something called a working memory. And the working memory is the amount of information that you can take and hold in your head for a temporary amount of time. And the reason it's important to think of this is because when you're writing code, you're actually spending more time with your medium or long-term memory. You know, you know what you did yesterday, you had the idea in your head, you know why you made certain, certain changes, you know why you made certain variable declarations. But the working memory is a, is a little more fluid. We only have so much and it's easy to exhaust. So to give you an example of how the working memory works, I'm going to take you through something called the NBAC test. So this is a test that psychologists use to assess how well someone's memory, working memory is working. And the way it works is, is this. You're going, to give, you're going to be given a series of letters and you have one question. Does a letter match the character three letters prior? All right, so I'm going to take you through how this works one at a time. So you'll get the letter T, and then the, that letter will go off screen. You'll get a letter A, and you'll get a letter L. Those are the letters you need to keep in your working memory. So you kind of have three spots. Then you're going to get another letter, G. You're going to ask, does it match three prior? In this case, it does not, so you can forget the T. So now in your memory, you have ALG. You get a new letter A. A does match. You forget the previous A, and then you just kind of move through this. And so the way this is like code is because you're constantly taking in information, forgetting other pieces of information, and comparing that information. All right, so now, in this case, A was the only letter that matched a letter three prior. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through the in-back test, just kind of give you a way for how it feels. So if you've kind of zoned out, now's a good time to look back up at the screen. I'm going to go one letter at a time and just kind of keep track of how many times it matches a letter three prior. You know, Keep a count on your fingers, it doesn't really matter. Just kind of keep track of how many times it comes up. Okay, everyone ready? Here we go. H, C, H, O, C, Q, L, C, K, L, and that's the end. Because this is normally when I look out over, over the audience and say, how many people do when you hold up your hand and things like that? So hold up your hand. I can't actually see you, but it's good to be physical during these things. Good to get a little movement. Here's the string of letters, and here are the letters that matched one, three prior. So I don't know about you, but it's, it's kind of interesting to have that feeling of how difficult that is to kind of keep that information in your head as you're moving through new information. But the thing is, this is the way our brain works on development. When we're reading code, we're taking in variables, we're kind of storing them in our head as something we'll have to refer to later. We're skimming functions, looking at utilities. And that's why it's so much more difficult to re jump into new code than it is to read your own code. Because when you're reading your own code, some of that information has been cached in your, in your medium or long-term memory. You don't have to take it and hold it on the fly. And this is why we have things like style guides. So here's some code that's written without any style applied to it. And 
it's kind of hard to read. At least it is for me. You know, there's variables declared in multiple spots. Sometimes conditionals have curly braces. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're indented. Sometimes they're not. It's, it's really confusing because it's hard to find a rhythm or a flow. So here's that same code written following pretty standard syntax rules. And again, this isn't, this isn't using any modern syntax, but it's so much cleaner, so much easier to read because you can see exactly where the starts and stops are. You know when you need to leave or when you need to go out of a conditional. All right, so now we're gonna talk about variable declarations. We're gonna assume you have three spots of working memory. We have probably somewhere between five and seven, but for purposes of this, let's say you have three. Now, originally JavaScript only had one type of variable declaration called var. You declare a variable, and so what happens is if you're reading this code, you would have that variable in your working memory. Next, you get another variable that goes into your working memory, and then a bunch of stuff happens. Now, a function probably shouldn't have 105 lines or whatever, but let's just forget that for now. Sometimes code is good, sometimes it's bad, who knows the reason why. But you have 100 lines of code, and there's just a bunch of stuff. So you're taking in all this inf extra information trying to store it in your working memory. And when you get to the bottom, it's really hard to say, well, what is, what is the total? There's no way of knowing, there's no predictability here because the total could be changed by maybe adding a discount or adding shipping. We don't really know. We don't know what's gonna happen in those 100 lines of code. All right, so clear out the, the working memory. We're gonna start over. Modern JavaScript has a variable declaration called const. And if you've heard of it, what it is, is it's a variable that you cannot reassign. So once you set it, you cannot change it. And what this does is, is unique. Essentially, it keeps your working memory empty. Now you may just kind of keep it in there, but the thing is, you know that there's a clear reference point. You know that the tax rate will never change. So you could always go back to it. If you have the, the next one total, then you also know that's not gonna change. So that keeps your working memory empty. Now what this does is this gives your code some predictability because someone looking at this code, they, may, they know when they get to the bottom that total is going to be exactly the same as it was on that original line. It also adds predictability to what this function does. You know that there's not gonna be any changes to the amount. So you can predict that it's gonna be doing something else. Maybe it's updating an inventory. Maybe it's, maybe it's making an order. You don't really know exactly, but you do know that it's not gonna change the total. It's doing some other work. All right, so clear out your working memory. We're gonna look at the next variable declaration. I'm gonna start by declaring tax rate with a const. So that's not gonna change. Keep your working memory clean. Now we're gonna use a variable declaration called let. Let is a variable declaration that can be reassigned. Now, the interesting thing about let is that this goes into our working memory, but since most of the time we use const, when we, when we declare a variable with let, we're actually kind of storing it with a little asterisk next to it. Because when we are saying that this variable can be reassigned, we're saying that probably this variable will be changed at some point, because otherwise you would keep it as const. So now we have some predictability here. During that 100 lines of code, we know something's probably gonna happen to total. Again, maybe a discount, maybe shipping, maybe you're removing the taxes. I, you don't really know, but you know total is going to change. So that's something you can kind of keep an eye out for as, as you're searching for bugs or as you're trying to add in new features. So looking ahead, what's a, a new functionality that's going to add or help with predictability in our code? And that one is private fields. So here is a class in JavaScript. And for the longest time, the way you declared private fields was with this underscore. And what it was, was it didn't actually create a private field. Really what it was, was a clue to other developers that you're not supposed to change this. Um, it's what I would call privacy by convention. And so the problem was that there was no force on it. So if you create an instance of a, of a class and then you try to change some, some field, it would succeed and then your total, your information would get changed at the end, the, the functions going forward. And I know that people change this because I did this for a long time. When I first started out, I used to console log out JavaScript objects, see this underscore, I would say, that's weird. Why isn't that in the documentation? I would change, do whatever I wanted to do. And then three months later, it would create a bug because I changed it on one part of the code and way down four or five functions later, someone uses it and they lose the result. In this case, the predictability is not 
the user reading is. In this case, the predictability that you're losing is you, is your own. You are losing control over what happens to your code. You're losing the predictability of which functions will be called and which won't. So it really comes down to, do you trust other developers to respect private fields? And that can be pretty, you know, pretty scary if you don't know if you can always trust the information to be the same. So obviously most languages have figured out a way around this problem with private fields. And there is a proposal in JavaScript right now to add that syntax to, to JavaScript classes. And it's this little operator right here. But what this operator does is it creates a private field just as you would expect. A private field, again, is a field that can only be changed by the class itself. So it cannot be changed on the instance of a class or by another class. And that means that if we create a new instance of a cart called get total, and someone tried to change the private field, they would be stopped by the compiler. They would be stopped, but well, maybe not the compiler, the interpreter. They would be stopped from doing it and receive a syntax error because they're trying to change that, which means that we would get that predictability we need. Your code would be predictable going forward because you'd know there's no way someone could change information after they've started using it. So that's what predictable means. Predictable means being able to know the future. The next principle of modern JavaScript is readable. Readable means understanding at a glance. And this is the key part there is at a glance. Because if you've ever tried to fix bugs on a code base you're not familiar with, you spend a lot of time skimming through code. And so the more you can write your code that it's easy to kind of intuit what's happening, even if you don't know the details, but kind of have a guess about where it's going, the, the better it will be at, at being maintainable, at being readable by other developers. So in the United States and probably other, other parts of the world, um, we have these, these health ratings for restaurants. And so the health inspector will go to a restaurant, he'll check to see how they're following the health codes, and then he'll give them either a grade of A, B, or C. Now, this seems like this is a pretty good way of communicating information. It seems like it's very clear. It tells the consumer what they need to know at a very quick glance. The problem is that sometimes information can easily be lost in the flow of other information. So here is a sign on some restaurant where they've cleverly hidden their health rating. I'll give you a chance, second, to see if you can pick out what it is. All right, so if you haven't caught it yet, they have a B rating and they just kind of turn it into a brunch, a brunch sign. So that information loses some readability because it's lost in the context of other information. There's this thing called the native phonetic alphabet. And the native phonetic alphabet is something that you've seen before, even if you don't know it. So movies such as Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, or there's an album I really like by Wilco called the Yankee Hotel Foxtrot. These are all using the native phonetic alphabet. The native phonetic alphabet was originally developed, as you might guess, by NATO. And it was a way of being able to communicate information in the military. So here's how it works. Here's a sentence, Hotel Echo Lima Lima Oscar Whiskey Oscar Romeo Lima Delta. And the person hearing this takes this information in, but they're really only focusing on the first letter. So what you're trying to communicate in this case is hello world. And the words are kind of there to add redundant information. The interesting thing about the native phonetic alphabet is how it came about. So the final choice of code words to use was made after hundreds of thousands of tests involving 31 nationalities. The qualifying feature was the likelihood of a code word being understood in the context of others. And that's really the key, the key point here. How well could a word stand out among different accents, among different levels of volume, with different background noise? How well can it stand out in the context of other words? And so the words have to sound like word, have to sound cannot sound like other words. It kind of got tongue tied there. You want them to be unique. So how does this relate to JavaScript? How does this idea of being able to communicate around in the context of other code come up? All right, well, here is a really simple function as a very simple for loop. And what it's doing is it has an array. It's going to loop over the prices array, and it's going to convert each, each um, string into a float. And it's going to return that. And you may look at this and think that this is a pretty good, pretty readable code. The problem is that it has this veneer of readability, but it actually, actually loses something. So for example, you have this array here. 
So you know you're going to get back an array, but you don't have any clue about what's going to be in that array. For example, you don't know the shape of the array. And when I say shape, I mean, what kind of information does it have? What kind of primitives? Does it have a string? Does it have numbers? You also don't know what it's going to be in, uh, excuse me, array of string, array of integers, got ahead of myself. You also don't know the size of the array. You don't know if it's going to be bigger, if it's going to be smaller, if it's going to be the same size. There's nothing clear at a glance. So here's the array getting a little more complicated. So now we have not just some numbers that are convertible to some strings that are convertible to numbers. We also have strings that we want to pull out. So we're looping over it. We're parsing the information. If that's truthy, so if it's a number, we're going to push it on the prices. Otherwise, we're going to get it. So as they get, as they get more and more complex and as we have more mutations, that readability really starts to drop. You know, as, as the complexity increases, it just bottoms out. And it bottoms out really quickly. And so that's where array methods come in. And array methods became massively popular around the release of ES26, which is again about four or five years ago. And at first, I didn't really understand why they were so popular. But I started to get that what they were doing was they were communicating intention. So here's the first function. And what we're going to do is we're going to map over the prices array. So what that map does is it takes each individual value and it does something with the value and it returns whatever you've asked it to do. In this case, we're parsing the floats. Now, what's interesting about the map method is it communicates to you some intention. You can know at a glance without looking at any of the functions, without looking at any of the data, that you're going to get an array that's the exact same size. So you're going to start off with an array of two items and you're going to end with an array of two items. You can know that just at a glance. As things get more complicated, you can start to segment out the complexity. So you can kind of glance at it and walk through how it works. So in this case, we're going to map over item, converting each item to a float. Then we're going to filter out the information that is not truthy. So we know that we're going to start with an array of the same size. We're going to make a change. And then we're going to have something that's the same shape. Again, the shape being the types of primitives that are in it. And but maybe a different size. And so you can start to look at how the complexity relates to the, to the total, to the, item, to the original array. And every array method contains this type of innate information inside of it. So if you have a map method, you know you're getting a different shape, but the same size. If you have a filter, you're having a different size, but the same shape. Every and some don't return an array at all. They return a Boolean. And then the reduce method, well, that one gets a little complicated. But that one is nice because at least you start off with an initial value. So you can look at that initial value and have an idea of what you're going to get in return. Now, one of the problems that people have had with, um, with some array methods is efficiency. So this is something I saw on Twitter, um, name is removed. And the, the author of this says, he realized that you could use reduce to replace a filter and map. Reduce can, um, is, can take any function. It can pretty much change an array to whatever you want. And so in this example, he's filtering, he's taking something that would have filtered, so reducing the size in a map, reduce, changing the shape, and he changes it to a single reducer. So here they are kind of written out, um, written out a little, a little clearer. So first we're going to filter and then map. And he, the bottom is the same thing, change to reducer. Now, in my mind, the top one is significantly more readable, because again, you can kind of go through it step by step. But the argument that the author is making is that it's a little less efficient because you're doing you're looping over each array twice. Now, here's the thing about readable code is I find that developers are often willing to sacrifice readability in this for the sake of performance. But the thing is, you don't really know the performance value until you kind of check it out, until you benchmark it. So in this case, I was curious about how it works. So I made an array of 1,000 items. And I did a test where we um, would start a timer run the function and then end the time and see what happens. And the thing is, the one that uses the map and the filter is actually significantly faster than the one that uses the reducer. And the reason has to do with the, the way the spread operator is used. But the idea here is that you should always benchmark if there's a problem. You should focus first on writing readable code. And then if you have issues, you could go back and start to benchmark and, and make changes as necessary. But readability is key. So looking ahead, what's something that we can do to increase readability in our code? All right, so here's another array. And our goal here is we want to make 
a string that says you have the following certifications, food, safety, security, and leadership. So what we're going to do is we're going to step through each of these items. First, we're going to remove all the duplicates, then we're going to capitalize the words, and then we're going to build the string. And so in this case, we will make a single function for each. First, remove all the duplicates. Then we're going to capitalize all the items. And then we're going to build the message. So um, how would we go about combining those together? Well, with just basic, simple JavaScript, the way you would do is by taking the output of each and putting it in the next function. Well, you lose some kind of readability here, because this is kind of goes against the way we learn how to read. You have to start from the inside and move out. So removing the duplicates first, move outward, capitalize all, build the message, move out again. And there's some tricks you can do with indentation to make it a little readable, where you can indent each one on a different line, but this is still a little bit of a problem. You have to start at the bottom and work your way up. It's not very readable. It's kind of hides what you're trying to do. And this is a problem that's happened in a lot of languages. If you've ever worked with any sort of Lisp dialect, they have just a ton of parentheses. And they can get really confusing and really hard to follow where one function ends and the other begins. And so JavaScript has this new operator that is still, they're still discussing it. I'm surprised this one hasn't been approved yet, but hopefully soon. And it's called the pipeline operator. And the pipeline operator is very simple. All it does is it takes the output of one function and makes it the input to the next function. So it has that pipe and the little, uh, the greater than sign there. And it just pipes the, the output of one to the input of the next. What that means is that you can rewrite your code like this. You can see the flow. The flow goes straight down. So certifications flows into remove duplicates, which flows into capitalize all, which flows into build message. It's a lot more readable because you can see exactly how the data changes each step of the way. It gets even better when things start to get a little more complicated. So here we're going to take a, take a price. We're going to apply a discount, round it to a certain value, and convert it, in this case, to, to US dollars. Now, the key here is that there's one trick. We have a higher order function, which is a function that returns another function. In this case, we are passing a discount, and then we want to pass the price in. So we're going to pass the discount, maybe 50%, and then it's going to return a function that anytime we pass in a price, we'll take 50% off that price. And the way you call higher order functions is with the double parentheses. Now, looking at this, it gets really hard to figure out what the heck is happening. You know, the complexity, again, is increasing, which makes the readability really drop. Trying to make it indented a little better, but still not super great. With the pipeline operator, it's super clear what's happening. You can see the data flow. It also gives you a way of understanding what's happening at a glance, because at a glance, you can see that discount takes an argument before it even before you even run the code. So without even looking into discount, I could infer that this is probably going to return another function. It's going to be a higher order function, because that's why we're calling it. So that's what readable is, understanding at a glance, giving those clues to future readers about what's happening without having to dig into the details. All right, the next principle of modern JavaScript is simple. Simple, the goal is having clear intentions. All right, here is an ad for an automobile from the 1960s. And this was kind of the way all advertisements looked back then. You know, there's a lot going on here. We have this picture of this car, happy little couple there chatting. For some reason, they have a picture of the trunk. I've done this talk many times. I still don't understand why the trunk is the most important feature, but apparently you can fit your golf clubs and it looks like a snare drum. Maybe it's a suitcase, I don't know. But it's a very cluttered image. And so things changed when along came what has been called the greatest ad of the 20th century. And here it is. And notice what's happening here. It has this, it took this thing that was massive and full of information and it cut it all out. It increased the negative space, and so it focuses your attention on what's really important, in this case, the Volkswagen, Volkswagen bug. And so when you're flipping through a magazine, we're flipping through a, a newspaper back in the 60s, this is immediately going to jump out and grab your attention because it focuses on what's most important. And you think this is a lesson that we would have learned. I can see I'm getting a lot of comments in chat, and I'm going to apologize that I won't be able to read those. Um, to flip back and forth. But Kimberly, I, I trust that if there's ever a time to jump in, you'll, you'll do it. Um, and feel free to interrupt too. That, that's fine with me. So sorry, going back to that. 
So you think we would learn this lesson about simplicity, but it's something we have to keep learning over and over. There we go. Here is Yahoo. This is from about 1999. Um, this is the internet I grew up with. And man, look how cluttered it is. It's just crazy. There's the certs, super tiny, right there under the stock picker and above the mail and beside the games and all that stuff. And this was actually an intentional goal of Yahoo. They wanted people to spend their time on this page. They didn't want to make it easy for them to leave. And along came this upstart. You may have heard of them. It's called Google. And they simplified it by stripping everything out. And so all it is is the search bar. And the funny thing is, looking at it now, doesn't this look really cluttered compared to the Google we have now? The Google we have now is just a single search. But the idea is that the more you can cut out the extra noise, the easier it is for someone to focus on the most important. And that's what simplicity is. All right, so let's talk about what that means in JavaScript. I have a couple of kids at home, a three-year-old and a five-year-old. And so I am relearning a lot about dinosaurs. And so as they get older, they learn more and more dinosaurs. So here's an array of dinosaurs, maybe that my kids know. And every once in a while, they'll learn a new dinosaur. And so if I were writing this in code, the way for a long time that you could add this dinosaur was with the method called push. And this is a method you see in almost every programming language. So push will add that dinosaur to the array, but the thing is it creates a mutation. So we, we, we have our new addition array, which has all the dinosaurs in it, but it also changes the original dinosaurs array, which could be a big problem. Excuse me, what about if you want to copy an array? Well, to copy an array, you had to use this method called slice. And I don't know about you, but there's no way that you'd be able to intuit that's how you copy an array. You call slice without any arguments and it make a copy of an array. It was just something you had to memorize. And of course, it wouldn't mutate the array, it would just create a copy. What about if you wanted to combine two arrays? Well, there's a method called concat. You take an array, call the concat method, and you pass in a new array. Now the question is, will you mutate the original array? And this was the thing that was so difficult about working with arrays for so long, is that some things were mutated, others won it, and there's no way to really know without memorizing everything. In this case, it doesn't mutate the original array. You just had to memorize that. So there are 37 different methods on arrays, not to mention all the methods that arrays inherit, of which there are quite a few. And the only way to work with them effectively was to just add all this to your memory, which was a real hassle, you know, and it took a lot of time to do it. And so along in ES6 came this new operator called the spread operator. And the spread operator are these three simple dots. And what the dots do is they take an array and they convert it into a list. Now, I'll admit when this came out, I had no idea why it was added to the language. Because I, I thought, how many times do I need to convert an array to a list? But what it does is it really simplifies how you work with arrays. For example, if you wanted to copy an array, all you would do is spread out the current, op the current array into new square braces. So again, this is one of those things that goes back to the earlier principles. It's very readable because you can know at a glance that copy is an array. You can see the square braces. It's predictable because you know that the dinosaurs array will never mutate. All you're doing is taking the values and putting them out. You know what's gonna happen and it's much more simple. And now all the other things that you had to memorize functions before are really just a matter of applying the information you have. So if you wanted to add an item to an array, you would spread out the current array. So taking all those current items and putting them out there and then tacking a new item on at the end. If you wanted to combine arrays, you would spread one out and put more in. And if it had some emergent functionality, so it was really simple to add lots of arrays together. You could have all these things that you could do that you could start to intuit. You didn't have to memorize. You could just think how, how to apply these with the tools you have. So looking ahead, what's something that we can do to simplify, simplify a task that's complicated, to add, take something hard and put it into a smaller package that's easier to read and easier to see? Well, one of my favorite features of JavaScript is called optional chaining. And it was finally approved at the beginning of 2020. And optional chaining works like this. So in JavaScript, you can have deeply nested objects. So in this case, we have an object with a field of foo that has a field of bar that has a field of baz. And if you want to get that information out, you would use the dot syntax. So object.foo.bar.baz would give you 42. That's all well and good. The problem is, what do you do when you try and get a field that doesn't exist? Well, in this case, it would throw an error. And this was a huge problem. 
because um, this comes up in every job I've ever had. You get a certain API response and you expect it to have a certain shape. And if something happens, maybe the API returned a faulty value. Maybe the user didn't fill something out. All of a sudden, you're going to have explosions all over your code base. It was really difficult to be predictable about what was going to happen. So there's some ways around that. You could write these elaborately complicated uh, strings of functions where you check to see if an object exists. And if it does return, doesn't return undefined, otherwise go to the next thing. Um, there are some libraries you could use, lodash, underscore. They all have methods for dealing with this. But there wasn't a clear way inherent in the language. And this became really difficult to do. You're not going to do this on every step. So this is where optional chaining comes in. Optional chaining is a really simple operator that does, um, does something very, very helpful. And what it does is if the field exists, it returns the field. Otherwise, it returns undefined. So in this case, object, foo, bar, baz, those all exist, and it returns baz. But if you try to get a field that doesn't exist, instead of throwing an error, it just returns undefined. So now you don't have to add in all this checking. You can use this simple operator to see whether that information is there. Again, it goes right up the chain. It makes it more readable because you can see that you are working with objects that may have some inherent uncertainty to them. And it makes it predictable because you know that this code will work whether or not the object is the shape you expect it to be. So it took this really complicated way of checking for information safely and reduced it down to a really simple operator. So simple as having clear intentions. It also means being able to do more with less code. But one thing I do want to point out is that simple does not equal short. I found that there's a certain tendency among developers, and I would put myself in this category, that we love to kind of reduce things as much as possible. We want to make the shortest code we have. It's almost like this badge of honor that you can make your code shorter than someone else's. Like it somehow shows that you, you're smarter. I don't, I don't know. But simple and short are sometimes in conflict. For example, let's say you had an array of names and your goal was to create all names less than five letters that aren't palindromes. Well, you could write something absolutely crazy like this and this would work. And this is about as short as you can get it. I was actually told by someone that it could get shorter. So there you go. Uh, I didn't know that, but this is pretty short. But notice how it's not predictable. It's not readable. It doesn't match any of those other parts of modern JavaScript. And that's why I think simplicity has to kind of be pushed down the list. You have to make sure something is readable and predictable before you can focus on simplifying. All right, the last principle of modern JavaScript is flexible. Flexible means using one thing in many ways. So the, the phone system in the, in the world was something that I've always found really interesting. You know, it was this massive effort that can connect people all over the world using mechanical switches and some very simple technologies. Very simple technologies, I guess I should say, applied in a very complex way. And there's a group of kind of proto-hackers that were called phone freaks. And what they would do is they would explore the phone system by being able to figure out the tones that would let them kind of explore through it, explore it. And the tool that they would often use is something called a blue box, which you could kind of program it to emit certain tones. So Steve Wozniak, for example, used to build these when he was in high school. Um, so that he could kind of make free calls when he went to college. He would sell them to his buddies out of his dorm room. I think that was actually one of the first things he and Steve Jobs did together was sell these things. Well, along came um, this, this person who figured out that there was this whistle from a box of Captain Crunch. And what it could do is it could handle, do a lot of the things that the blue box could do without having to have all the knowledge of electronics. So someone figured out that if you took this whistle, it would blow a perfect 2600 hertz tone which is actually the tone you needed to be able to break out of the dial tone and go into kind of what we would call the admin area now. So here's the person who's figured it out. His kind of hacker name became Captain Crunch. And what this did is it opened up the whole world to being able to explore this, this phone system. So I think it's interesting because it's flexible for two reasons. One, it shows how a toy can have multiple purposes that you don't even realize. And two, it shows that the phone system is so incredibly, so incredibly flexible that it could handle all these different ways of moving through, moving through the world and communicating information using simple tones. All right, so how can we think about this in JavaScript? How can we use one thing in many ways? How can we have something that's adaptable to unforeseen circumstances? Let's say you have a page, maybe that it's a login page, 
and you get back an object of a user. And when you get back that object, you want to do certain things. Maybe you want to get any alerts that the user has so you can display them, or you want to log the visit. So you could call them one by one. Maybe you, you're an enterprising developer, you want to make this shorter. So you create a function called apply, where you pass a user and then a couple actions, and it performs the actions and returns an array. Now this works in this situation, but the problem is it's not very flexible. So what do you do when you get a new function that does something else? Well, now you're kind of stuck. You'd have to go back and you have to find all the places that you have this apply function and update it. And this is where our three favorite dots come back. And those are called the rest operator. So when you're taking information expanding, it's called spread. The rest operator works the opposite. It takes a list of items and collects it into an array. So for example, excuse me, I'm about to cough. <coughs> if we have our function called apply, we can pass a value and then we can pass any number of actions we want. And these actions will be all collected into a single array. Then we can use our array methods to map over them. What this does is it gives our, our function a significant amount of flexibility. So for example, we could start by saying apply our password ID, pass in two functions. The functions get collected into this array and then you map over that array and you get the results. Then if we get a new function, all we have to do is tack it on. We don't have to change the apply function in the first place. The apply function can take three items here, maybe in another file it would take four, maybe somewhere else it would only take one. So it's flexible, can handle different situations, different types of data. What happens if we have one action and we want to perform many items? And this is where uh, we would just kind of flip it. We pass the action first and pass a many number of users. So we could pass two users, we could pass 10 users. It would do the same thing. The only downside to this is what if we had many actions and many items? Well, the problem with the rest operator is it has to be the last item in a function. Because for example, how would you know where users end and actions begins? <clears throat> and this is why, you know, going back to my original, original analogy, it's so important to understand the language as it existed even before some of the newer modern syntax, because the way to get this is to use um, a technique that's been in JavaScript a long time, which is the higher order functions. Because you can see here that we actually have two specific, two different kind of categories of information that we're looking for. We want to be able to set the users and we want to be able to set the actions. So what we can do is we can create a higher order function, again, a function that returns another function, and we can split those parameters. We can give those parameters single responsibilities. <clears throat> so we can have a function that takes a number of values. It returns a function that takes a number of actions, and then it will map over those values. And for each value, it will map over the actions and perform the action. So I'll give a sec to kind of think on that. It's the way you would use it is you would pass in the values, pass in the actions, and you get an array back of the information applied to each, each action applied, excuse me, each value applied to each action. So in this way, you could use rest operators more than once. This, fun this function is really flexible because you can have a variable number of two different types of parameters. It can handle a lot of situations. Further, you know, modern, uh, excuse me, higher order functions allow you to do different things called partial application. In this case, we're going to apply some values to a user group. And then that's a piece of data. That function is a piece of data that you can send around to different codes. You can pass this information to another code where you actually apply the actions to it. So it gives you the flexibility both to apply multiple variable pieces of data. <coughs> Sorry, I keep coughing now. But also it gives you the ability to apply some data at one point in your code and more data at another point in your code. It gives you the flexibility to move things around. So here's another example. Uh, we have different birds for each state. These are the different states that I've grown up in, Kansas, Wisconsin, and New Mexico. And let's say we had a function called get birds, and it returns the names of the birds. Problem is that's not very usable because we don't know which bird would go with which state. So one way you can do this is creating a method called zip. And zip is a popular action that you can see in a lot of, a lot of languages. And what it does is it combines the, excuse me, two arrays and puts the, the first item with the second item and so on like that. 
So this is another example where you can spread out all the items on the left, take all the items on the right, and then map them together so that the state aligns with the bird. In this case, you pass the states. You would use the spread operator to turn all the states, which would then be collected into the left. Use the spread operator to return all the birds, collect that into the right variable, and then it would combine them into a single array that has both the bird and the state. So just a way of kind of applying something and getting the flexibility by combining the spread operator and the rest operator with higher order functions. Looking ahead, so another piece of syntax that's been recently approved is called object from entries. And what object from entries, whoops, I forgot that this is one of my favorite pictures. So another way of thinking about flexibility is being able to morph from one thing into another. So this is a picture of an octopus. Uh, octopuses are amazing because they're able to change both the texture and the color of their skin. So they can blend in both to something both with the visual but also the, the textual. It's able to change itself to whatever situation it needs to be. That's really flexible. Here's a, a not very often used operator called map. And what a map is, it's a, it's a key value pair. So if you created a map, in this case, we're gonna make a map of dogs. We're setting the color of black, the breed of Labrador. And if you want to get an information, you would just pass the key to the get parameter and return the information you want. <coughs> Sorry, I keep coughing now. Now, the thing that was really nice about maps is the spread operator works on it. And what it does is it can convert an array, a map to an array of pairs. So if you needed to, you could take a map, convert it to an array of pairs, and now all of a sudden, you would have access to any type of information. So if you wanted to um, convert a map into an array of pairs, you can then use a sort method or a map method or a join method or any array. So even though the map acted like an object or was a key value pair, you had access to any of the array methods with just a simple transformation. The problem was is that it was difficult to use in situations where you needed to have an object. So in this case, we're creating a map. It's a key value pair. It's kind of an object like. But if you passed it in here, you would get an error. Because in this case, a library called query string, which converts an object to a string, needs, a, needs an object. And this is where object from entries comes in. What object from entries does is it takes an array of pairs and converts that into an object, where the first item in the array is the key, and the second item is the value. So you can take an array, put in object from entries, and all of a sudden you have an object. Something that already exists and has for a while is called object entries, and that converts an object into an array of pairs. So it takes the key value and makes it into an array of pairs. Now what this does is really amazing, because what you can do is you can take a map, convert it to an object with object from entries, going through the array, and then pass it into this object. What that means is that your data can be flexible. It can be whatever you want it to. You can take that information out, turn it into an array, move the object from entries to convert it into a, an array, and then turn that into a map. That means that you're not stuck with any particular data format. Your data can be whatever you want it to be. It could be a map when you need it to be a map, an object, a map again, an array. It has that flexibility to change depending on what would work best in your code, what would be most efficient, what would be easiest to read. Your data is not stuck in a particular format. So flexible means adapting to the situation. <coughs> and it also means using one thing in many ways. So here are the four principles of modern, script, modern JavaScript, predictable, knowing the future, readable, understand at a glance, simple, having clear intentions, and flexible is using one thing in many ways. But one thing I didn't really talk about that I want to conclude on is what makes good code? You know, this is kind of a hard question to answer. Here's a picture of kind of the stages of evolution. You're, you've probably seen this before. It's a very familiar image. And the Harvard um, evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould gave a really good talk about this image where he says, this image actually contains a lot of misinformation in it. It's actually kind of has some, implies some things that are not true. And he says, one thing that this implies is that it implies that evolution is a, a movement towards something, that it's a, a stage of progress. And he says, that's not actually true. What evolution is, is adapting to the situation at hand. And so for example, here is a cheetah. You know, it's a large cat. It lives in the African savanna. 
It has a long body because that helps keep it cool. Long late so it can stand up and see over the grass and so it can move quickly. It's well adapted to its environment. This is a snow leopard. They live in Afghanistan and Tibet. It has short legs so that it can jump through rocks easily and so it can move into cages. It has a thick coat because it lives in the winter. Uh, white fur so it can blend in with the snow and the dirt. Now, if you were to ask the question, what's the better cat? Well, that question doesn't really make sense. Because first of all, everyone knows that the best cat is a cat that can fit in a box. But really, it's the same thing with code. The best code is the code that makes the most sense in the environment it's in. So here's an interesting tweet I saw from Sebastian McKenzie. He said, 99% of the time, I see the usage of array sum and array reduce would it be much more readable to have a manual loop. So he's using one of my favorite words. And so this is the example he has. He says he, that the above one in his, in his belief is more readable than the lower one. Now, I would argue that really depends on the situation you're in. If you're in a code base with a lot of developers that some work in JavaScript, some don't, then yeah, the first one is probably more readable. If you work in a code base where it's primarily JavaScript developers, they primarily use, they primarily use um, array methods, then the bottom one is more readable. The best code is the best code for the project it's in. And it's the best code. The best code is the best code for your team. So writing code is really a matter of trying to make it fit with the overall project, trying to make it cohesive so that anyone can work on anything at any time. And so that's why starting back to this code I said at the beginning, this is really good code because it was the best code adapted to the situation it had available. Whereas now we have new tools, new ways of thinking, and this is probably better code because it makes use of the code that the tools that we have available. Um, sorry, this was <laughs> a leftover slide from another one. So again, my name is Joe Morgan on Twitter at Joe S. Morgan. Um, if you like this, tweet at me, let me know. I always love getting gifts from people with their reactions. So if you have a reaction gift, that always makes my day. Otherwise, like I said, feel free to reach out anytime. It could be a week, it could be a month, it could be a year. I don't care. Uh, if you ever have a question or just want to know something, let me know. So I think what I will do is, Kimberly, do you have questions that you, you want to ask? How do you want to go from here? Yes, we've had one question come through, um, which, but yeah, if there are any other questions, you know, do drop them in or, you know, you can come on the screen. But I just want to say thank you so much. That was such a good, like, explanation. It was, everything was so clear and so easy to understand. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> so our question, why are maps not very often used in JavaScript and would you use objects instead? Yeah, so I think your question kind of started to answer it is that, so the, a map is a key value store and an object we use like a key value store. Now, the thing is objects are not optimized for key value stores. So the look of time is a lot slower. Um, I was on a, a personal mission to get more people to use that. I've since abandoned that admission, a mission because I think it's more people are used to objects. But the times that I have seen them used, um, I've seen them used in the React, the React code base because they have to do a lot of lookups. And so when it's efficiency is the key, they're a good thing to use. Um, that's, that's kind of the main method. The other time I would use them is if you are adding or removing values, it's a lot easier to delete a map, a, a key value in a map than it is in an object. So that would be the other way I would use it. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? You can either drop it in the chat or turn on your camera and speak. Completely up to you. Everyone stunned into silence. Yeah, someone shared in the chat room the operator lookup. That is super awesome. Um, we should add that. I'll make a note to add that to the outgoing email. Yeah. Yeah, I've made a note of it. I, I might even do a separate tweet from the code bar account tomorrow. Um, okay, well, I guess if we've got no questions, we can wrap up early. Uh, I saw some someone asking the pipeline, the pipe operator when. Uh, hard to know. So the the way JavaScript functions work is there's something called the oh, I'm gonna butcher it now, the ECMAScript committee. I think that's the name. And essentially they meet, I think, quarterly. Yeah, it's quarterly, yeah. yeah. And then, so people champion certain things, they have a discussion, they come with feedback. 
and that one's been bouncing around for a while, I think, because there's there's two competing two competing versions, and they haven't quite gotten them synced up. So I don't know when. Hopefully soon. I feel it's in stage in stage two or three. I'd have to look it up. Yep. Cool. Any other questions? Oh, what do you recommend for keeping keeping up to date with modern JavaScript developments? Yep. Yeah. Um, let's see. There are two things. Without having to invest tons of time into it. Yeah. So I, I think one of the things is everyone is everyone is different in, in the kind of ways they prefer information. So obviously Twitter is a popular one. I've never been good at keeping up on Twitter because I'm just I'm just not really a big Twitter user. Um, so I tend to use more, I tend to prefer newsletters. And um, there's two newsletters that I like because they kind of collect some of the most information, some of the best information and, and share it out in digest form. One is from someone called Dr. Axel Roshmeyer. And the website is Tuality. I would put that there. And he's good because he's always up on the latest features. He actually may be on the ECMAScript committee. So if you want to know like, the, the, the hot new thing that's coming out, he's a good person. Um, another one is this newsletter called JavaScript Weekly. And that's more of a roundup of a lot of different JavaScript stuff. So it includes not just features, but also libraries and things like that. And that's a good one too, just kind of know what's going on, what some of the new new libraries that are coming out are is and things like that. So those are the two places I do, I, I usually go to. Cool, and I'll pop those into the email that I'll send out. Um, someone has asked, can you give an overview of your career so far, the ups, downs, and any tips for newbies? Oh, yes, thank you. That's actually a really good question because I, I made a note to say this at the beginning and I forgot. Um, for those of you who are coming to this as a second career, that's me. I did the same thing. Um, I my, my undergraduate degree is in philosophy. I have a master's degree in library science. I was a librarian for a couple of years. Um, and what happened was as, as a librarian, we had no budget <laughs> with government office, low budgets. And so if I wanted something, I had to make it myself. And so I started doing learning just enough code to make things that worked and made a little bit more, made a little bit more. It's kind of realized that I was pretty good at it and I liked it. And, um, and I should say, I started by getting a book. I was a good librarian. I checked, got a book from the library, read it, worked through it. And so at one point, I made a jump to a small company. So I would say my, my recommendation to people starting out is either one, look for small, yay, philosophy and librarians in the chat. Um, look for small places because they're willing to take risks on people. Or another good way is to look for jobs in QA because a lot of QA people start off and then become developers. Um, so I, I went the small bit, small route, and it's pretty brutal the first couple of years. I would say the first year was definitely a low point. I, there was a while where I thought for sure I was going to get fired. Um, somehow made it out, and it's just, you know, it's a, it's a time thing. As you, as you get more experience, you'll get, you'll get better. And I will also point out that you will feel imposter syndrome, and it will never go away. The only thing that changes is you get better at ignoring it. And I was talking with someone, some people that I work with in Kansas City, and one of the individuals said that he has a master's in computer science. He's been working at 15 years in the industry and he still gets imposter syndrome. So <laughs> just recognize that it happens to us all. Um, yeah, highs and lows. I guess my high for my career is, is going back to QA, one of the there was a person I worked with who she she started off as a writer, then became a QA engineer, later became a, um, she was a QA engineer on my team, then she became a developer on my team. And she recently has gone to work for the Pokemon company, which is like the coolest developer job that I've seen someone get. So that one makes me feel really good. You know, the fact that that she's, she's yeah, very, very awesome person. Um, so watching her make that, that journey was really, was really special to me. I want her job. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Most, most programming job I've heard. <laughs> yeah. Um, someone has said, do you have a good way for me to get my head around hooks and promises? Um, so two different things, I guess. Uh, hook, hooks as in React hooks? 
I'm uh, assuming so, yeah. You know, hooks hooks are one of those things where they're both easier and they're easier and harder <laughs> to to work with than React had before. Um, I'm just looking up something. I'm going to share an article, not because I think I'm a genius, because I wrote on it. So hopefully, hopefully this will help you get around it. I, I think with most programming things, the secret, it's kind of a generic answer, but the secret is you have to build something on your own with it. So go through a tutorial, but then immediately after that, come up with an idea of your own. Um, the smaller, the better. It's hard to come up with an idea that's small and then try and apply it. Try to rewrite something that you've already written with hooks. And same thing with promises. Promises, I mean, yeah, they're just kind of hard because they take some, some mental effort to kind of get used to. Um, I think the easiest way to think about them is to think about that, it's to think of them in terms of callbacks. So there's the async and await syntax, which is good, but the original way of working with promises was to pass a callback and then you used, um, the then, then method. And what I think that's good for is, because you can, that actually helps you think of the, in terms of when the data is finished coming, what do you do with it? And that's really what, it, what promises are about. The data will come when it comes. What do you do when it gets there? So I, I don't know. I guess I don't have any good advice on that one. <laughs> yeah, eloquent JavaScript is a good example. That's a I, good one. I was just trying to share a blog post um, and it's explaining promises, but in a form of ordering donuts at a shop. And it's a really good, if you're a visual learner like me, it's yeah. a really good explanation. Um, and yeah, promises are hard. And whenever I'm learning a new thing, or even like hooks, I find I have to do something like three or four times in different situations to understand it. Because just doing a tutorial and then doing it once, I'm like, oh, okay, I get that. But I actually have to do it for me normally like a few times um, before it sinks in properly. Yep. Um, another question, what is the main benefit of using classes in JavaScript over the older prototype inheritance? I hear conflicting arguments. Um, so the main reason to use classes is because that's what other people understand. The, the, the risk to it is that there's some trickiness in how a method is inherited. So if in a class, and see, I can't even remember, and I've had to look this up multiple times, if you have a class that has a method on it, that's just a regular method, then I think it's not part of the, it is part of the prototype. But then you have, if you have a method that's defined as an arrow method defined to a property, it's an instance method. It's not part of the prototype. It won't get, so, um, so the risk is that the biggest problem with classes and the reason that they were so controversial when they came out is because they hide some of that subtlety and because it ultimately does get, get compiled down to prototypes, um, you could lose some of that. I think that the situations come up rarely enough that I would stay, I always stick with classes just because it's easier to read and more people are used to them. And then when the situations come up, there are nasty bugs to find, but they're rare enough that it's worth the risk. You know, that's always the way things are. Perfect. I think that's all of our questions. No more have come in. 